We're going to pick up where we left off last time. So if you would, turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 47. And we're going to read verses 27 and 28 in just a second. But first, let me explain a few things about these two verses. Verses 27 and 28 serve as a transition from one subject to another and from one time period to another. You see, the story is going to jump from the time that Joseph saved Egypt from starvation to the end of Jacob's life. So we're jumping from one subject to another, but we're also jumping from one time period to another. And for the story to be able to flow smoothly, you have to have a transition. And that's the purpose of verses 27 and 28, to provide that smooth transition. And the best way to do that really is to give a brief synopsis of what took place between the time that Jacob arrived in Egypt to the time of his death. And that's what verses 27 and 28 do. They provide us with a brief synopsis of what happened between the time that Jacob arrived in Egypt and the time that he died. So now that you know that, let's read verses 27 and 28. Meanwhile, the people of Israel settled in the region of Goshen in Egypt. There they acquired property, and they were fruitful, and their population grew rapidly. Jacob lived for 17 years after his arrival in Egypt. So he lived 147 years in all. Now I want you to notice that Jacob lived for 17 years after he arrived in Egypt. Now if Jacob arrived in Egypt during the end of the second year of the famine, and the famine lasted for seven years, that means that he lived in Egypt during the last five years of the famine. Right? Right. And if he lived in Egypt for 17 years, that means that he lived another 12 years after the famine. Let's think about that. He lived 17 years in Egypt. He arrived at the second year, the end of the second year of the famine, which means that he endured five years of the famine. Subtract five from 17 and you get 12. So he lived during 12 good years. Now, during those 17 years, Jacob's family acquired property in the region of Goshen. They also prospered and they multiplied, which is setting us up for the book of Exodus. I don't know if you realized it, but we're getting very close to the end. Chapters 47, beginning in verse 27, chapter 48, chapter 49, and chapter 50 are all about Jacob's death. And so we're getting very close to the end. And what we're being told here in verses 27 and 28 is telling us what's going to happen in the book of Exodus. Because eventually, the Israelites are going to become a threat to the Egyptians because of their prosperity and because of their great numbers. But that's another story. For now, what I want you to see is that what God told Abraham was beginning to happen. Now, look at verses 29 through 31. As the time of his death drew near, Jacob called for his son Joseph and said to him, Please do me this favor. Put your hand under my thigh and swear that you will treat me with unfailing love by honoring my last request. I know it says this last request, but this is considered to be Jacob's last request. Do not bury me in Egypt. When I die, please take my body out of Egypt and bury me with my ancestors. So Joseph promised, I will do as you ask. Swear that you will do it, Jacob insisted. So Joseph gave his oath. And Jacob bowed humbly at the head of his bed. Now, obviously, Jacob was a man of great faith. And he believed in all of the promises of God. So, of course, he wanted to be buried in the land that his descendants were going to inherit as their homeland. He wanted to be buried in the land that God had promised to Abraham's descendants, Isaac's descendants, and his descendants. He didn't want to be buried in a foreign land. Now, why was that so important to Jacob? Well, I want you to think about this. If God promised to make your descendants into a great nation, and and, and he also referred to them as his chosen people, and he also promised to give them a homeland, but then he took it one step further. He said, this nation is going to be named after you, Nolan Land. Would you want to be buried anywhere else? Think about it. No way. You want to be buried in the future homeland of your descendants. You want to be buried in the land that's going to be named after you. Not in some foreign land, but only if you truly believed that this was going to happen. 
And people, Jacob believed this with all of his heart. He believed the promises of God. And that's why it was so important for him to be buried in the land of Canaan and not in Egypt. And Joseph had the very same faith that his father had. So he told his descendants, and when we get to chapter 50, verse number 25, we're going to see this. So he told his descendants to carry his bones with them when they left Egypt so he could also rest. In the promised land. Now, rather than give you that, because we're going to go to Genesis 50, we'll be studying that as we go through this chronologically, but let me take you to the New Testament. Let me show you what the New Testament says about Jacob and Joseph and their desire to go to the promised land. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 21 and 22. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on a staff. In fact, that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. This is talking about that. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. Oh yeah, Jacob believed, and so did Joseph. Now, this was so important to Jacob that he made Joseph swear, not promise, that he would bury him in Canaan, not Egypt. Look at verses 29 through 31 again. As the time of his death drew near, Jacob called for his son Joseph and said to him, Please do me this favor. Put your hand under my thigh and swear that you will treat me with unfailing love by honoring this last request. Do not bury me in Egypt. When I die, take my body out of Egypt and bury me with my ancestors. So Joseph promised. He promised. He didn't swear. He promised. I will do as you ask. Swear that you will do it, Jacob insisted. Now, I want this to be an oath. I want you to make a vow. So Joseph gave his oath, and Jacob bowed humbly at the head of his bed. Now, this was a special type of oath that that, uh, Joseph took. And it can seem a little kinky if you don't understand the custom of that time. So if you don't mind, let me explain why Jacob wanted Joseph to put his hand under his thigh and swear to him that he would bury him in Canaan, not in in, uh, Egypt. And what that actually meant by slipping his hand under his thigh and taking a vow in that way. First of all, what you need to know is that the person making this type of oath didn't slide his hand under the other person's thigh he slid it under the man's genitals. You see, the word thigh in verse number 29 is translated from the Hebrew word yarek, and it does not refer to a man's thighs. It actually refers to his genitals. Well, then, Alan, why does it translate it that way? Because when the Bible was being translated, it wasn't socially acceptable to put genitals in there. So they use a euphemism. They use the word thigh, knowing that scholars would understand what this word means. But the word yareg does not refer to the thigh. It refers to a man's genitals. So this type of oath required the person making the promise or making this vow to slide his hand under the genitals of the person he was making this vow to. And he held it there while he took the oath. Now, before everyone gets grossed out, Let me remind you of something. We talked about this in in the uh, chapter 24, if you remember that. So before you get grossed out, let me explain something. This was done on the outside of the clothing, not under the clothing. In fact, let me illustrate how this was done. The person who was requiring the oath, in this case it was Jacob. He wanted, I mean it was, yes, Jacob. He wanted Joseph to swear to him. So the person requiring the oath would sit down. Or if he was near death, bedridden, someone would help him to sit up on the bed. And the person who was making the oath would come and kneel down before him. And that person kneeling down before him would take his hand and slide it under the men's genitals on the outside of his clothing. And he would hold it there while he took the oath. Let me give you an example. Not going to be crass here, but we're all adults. So if I wanted someone to make an oath... This type of oath, this is a special oath. This is not any old kind of oath. This is a special oath. I would sit down, and I would tell this person, I want you to swear to me. The other person would kneel before me, and he would slide his hand underneath the genitals, and he would hold it there as he made the promise. 
That's what this is saying. Now, this type of oath with a hand under the genitals symbolized that his descendants, his seed, would make sure that the person making the oath kept it. And if he didn't keep his oath, the man's descendants would avenge him. In other words, they would punish him for failing to perform his duty, failing to keep his word. Now, you need to understand that in pagan circles, they did this type of oath also. And in the pagan circles, it usually meant that if a person didn't keep his word after making this type of oath, his descendants would kill that person. As I told you in chapter number 24, only a dying man or a man who thought he was close to death made someone take this type of oath. And do you remember why? Well, it's because this type of oath implied that you weren't going to be around to ensure, to make sure that that person kept his word. So your children or your grandchildren would have to make sure that the person kept his word. And that's why he slipped his hand under the genitals, because that symbolized your seed would take care of him if he didn't, take, uh, if he didn't perform what he promised to do. Now, obviously... What Jacob was asking of Joseph meant that he wasn't going to be around to make sure that Joseph did what he promised to do. And that's why he made Joseph take this type of oath. He wasn't going to be around. What's he want him to do? He wants to be buried when he dies. I want to be buried in Canaan. Well, he's not going to be around to know whether or not that happens. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've had family members die, and boy, they really wanted something. When I pass away, this is what I want you to do. And what do you normally say? Well, they're gone. They won't know whether we did it or not. Yeah, some of you aren't people of your word. Joseph, or Jacob knew that, so he wanted to pick the one who had the birthright because he'd proven himself worthy, Joseph. And he said, I want you to swear. I'm not going to be around to make sure that you did it, but my seed will be. And this is to remind you that you have a responsibility to do what you promised to do. Now, let's be honest. Joseph's brothers couldn't have done squat to Joseph if he hadn't done what he promised to do to Jacob. I mean, what are they going to do? He's a vizier, the vizier. If they wanted to, to try and avenge their father, they would be killed. I mean, you're going to attack the vizier? There's not a thing they could do. But you see, Jacob understood something. He understood that Joseph was a man of character. Joseph kept his word, and Joseph was a family man. And Jacob knew that if he took this type of oath, Joseph would not let him down, and he would not let his brothers down. And that's why he made Joseph take that type of oath. Now, I want you to imagine, because we want to take this situation, this custom, and we want to imagine how it would be in today's time. So I want you to imagine if your father was on his deathbed, and he called you and your siblings to his room. It would only be the males, no females in there. Sorry, women. And he made you, because you had the birthright. You're going to be the executor of the will. Remember, that's what birthright means. You not only get a double portion, but you're going to be responsible for all of the single women in the clan. That's why you get a double portion. But you're also leader of the family. So, he makes you, in front of all of your male siblings take your hand and slide it under his genitals while you take an oath. And he then goes out and he tells everyone what you vowed to do and the type of vow you made, and you had witnesses there. Now imagine if the, today's court recognized this type of oath. What would happen if you didn't keep your word? Well, if you didn't keep your word, your siblings could take you to court to avenge their father, and you would lose everything if it was the way it was back then. People, that's how powerful this type of oath was in that day. You see, this type of oath allowed them to avenge their father in the court and also out of the courtroom. It was kind of like honor killings are today within the Muslim society. You see, in Muslim countries today where they're governed by Sharia law, they allow honor killings because the Hadith says the blood of a Muslim may not be legally spilt other than in one of three instances— and then they list the three instances. Number one, the married person who commits adultery. So if you commit adultery, if you were living in a, in a Muslim country today, 2012 getting ready to be 2013, if you were in Saudi Arabia, if you were in Afghanistan, 
If you're in any of the Muslim countries where Sharia law is in effect, you would be murdered or killed. It's an honor killing because you've committed adultery. That's reason number one. Reason number two, a life for a life. If you kill someone, your life will be taken. And the third reason, one who forsakes his religion and abandons the community. That's why you don't see too many people converting to Christianity if they're Muslims. But you see, if a woman goes out and she doesn't do what her husband says, well then, in the husband's mind, you're abandoning the faith. And the courtroom is going to come in here and support the husband to kill you. That's honor killings. That's part of Sharia law. Now, I want you to understand that in that part of the country, this is what we're going back to 3,500 years ago. We're talking about this type of vow where you slid your hand underneath the man's genitals and you were making a vow. And if you did not do what you promised to do, you were saying that that person's seed, his descendants, his children, his grandchildren, even his great-grandchildren could avenge their father because you didn't do what you had said you would do. And I just kind of wanted you to understand, because this is a special type of oath, and when you're reading through the book of Genesis, you come to this type of oath twice. And it's like, oh my gosh, what are they doing? Well, this was the culture at that time. Now let's move on to chapter 48, verses 1 and 2. One day, not long after this, the word came to Joseph. So right after he gives this last request, he now is going to take care of several other things because he realizes he's dying quick. Just kind of giving you a quick synopsis before we read this. One day, not long after this, word came to Joseph, your father is failing rapidly. So Joseph went to visit his father, and he took with him two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. What order are they? Do you remember? Those are his two oldest sons. Manasseh is the oldest. Ephraim is the next to the oldest. He's the second son. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. When Joseph arrived, Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to see you. So Jacob gathered his strength, and he sat up in his bed. Now, I want you to underline the phrase, felling rapidly. That phrase is translated from the Hebrew word kala. And the, New, and the New Living Translation did a great job in translating this. The other translations didn't because it said that he fell ill, and that is not what kala means. You see, kala does not refer to a particular illness or sickness that Jacob might have caught. No. Kala refers to the declining health of an old person. So when it says that his health, he was rapidly declining, what it's actually saying is that he had gotten old and he was, his health was failing rapidly. So that's a great translation. Now, at this point in the story, Jacob was how old? We're at the end of his life. 147 years old. And he knew that death was near when he made Joseph swear that he would bury his body in Canaan. But soon after he made him swear that, his health started going downhill really fast. It started rapidly failing. So someone was sent to tell Joseph. When Joseph heard, he immediately went to his father, but he also took two of his oldest sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, Manasseh and Ephraim were in their early 20s at this time. Now, how do we know they were in their early 20s? Because most of you have been taught by your Sunday school teachers, they were little boys and they sat on Jacob's right knee and left knee. That's not what it says in the original. It says he sat, he, they stood next to his knees. We'll get to that. I might not even bring that up. But I want you to understand at this point in the story, Manasseh and Ephraim are in their early 20s. If you remember, they were born before Joseph's brothers went to Egypt to buy grain. So they were born during the seven years of prosperity. So at this time, they were somewhere in their early 20s. Because you remember, there were seven years of famine. And then Jacob lives 12 more years, which makes that 19. But they were born before that, so they're in their early 20s. Now, look at verses 3 and 4. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz. And what is Lutz? Where is Lutz? It's known by another name, Bethel. So as you're going through the book of Genesis, sometimes it will refer to it as Lutz. Sometimes it will refer to it as Bethel. Same place. So remember, it's the same story. So Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz or Bethel in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful, and I will multiply your descendants. I will make you a multitude of nations, 
And I will give this land of Canaan to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Now let me say this. Every Christian who believes in the Bible should hold that the land does not belong to the Palestinians. Who does it belong to? Israel. Why? Because it was given to them 3,500 years ago and they held it until the Romans finally caused them to be dispersed among the nations. Now, they were dispersed before that by the Assyrians, the northern tribes were, the southern tribes by the Babylonians. But I want you to understand, they always kept a remnant there. In fact, even during the dispersion, the diaspora, there were still Jews there. When the Jews started coming back, they bought that land legally. In fact, in 1948, when they divided or actually made them into a recognized nation, it was actually a two-state nation. But the Palestinians were not content with that, and they attacked the Israelites, and the Israelites thumped their butt. That's their land. And let me say this. You can say it's not. You can give me all types of reasonings, but you better read the Bible. He said, I'll give this to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And when Jesus returns, Israel's boundaries will actually go back, if you read the Bible, to their original location. In fact, it's more than it ever had been in the past. That's what God intended. But that's not what we're talking about. Maybe I need to read this again because I got off. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at, the, at Lutz in the land of Canaan and he blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful. I will multiply your sins. I will make you a multitude of nations. And I will give this land of Canaan to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Now, when Joseph arrived and went in to see Jacob, Jacob sat up in his bed. And in preparation for what he was about to do, he began telling Joseph what God had promised him at Bethel. Now, we're all familiar with what God had promised to Jacob, right? It was the same thing that he promised to Abraham. It was the same thing that he promised to Isaac. But I'm going to point out something that I haven't mentioned before. It's a little detail, and I've been saving it until we got to this chapter because it goes with this chapter. So I'm going to give you this, or I'm going to point out this little bitty detail, and I want you to understand that it's very pertinent to what Jacob is about to do. So let's look at the promise again, and let me point that little bitty detail out. Look at verses 3 and 4 again. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz, that's Bethel, in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful, and I will multiply your descendants. I will make you a multitude of nations, plural. Stop right there. Let's not go any further. Do you see that? God said, I will make you a multitude of nations, plural. In other words, within this nation that, I, this nation that I'm going to make out of your descendants, and that will be named after you, the nation of Israel, this nation, singular, Israel, will be made up of a multitude of nations, plural. Did you catch that? In other words... The nation of Israel, singular, will consist of many nations. I don't mean, I don't mean many nations. I mean many nations. Much like the United States of America... Is made up of 50 states. So according to God's promise to Jacob, the nation of Israel, all of his descendants, would be made up of different tribes or nations. Twelve to be exact. So God promised to Jacob that he would make his descendants into one unified nation, but then he took it a step further and he told him that this nation singular would consist of a multitude of nations, plural, which were tribes. In fact, it's the Hebrew word am. I'm not, gonna I'm not going to uh, actually do the Hebrew for you, but it's pronounced am. 
And it's written plural, and it means people or tribes or nations. So this nation of Israel is going to be made up of a multitude of tribes. Each one is like its own state. And each of these tribes would be named after one of Jacob's sons. And that's why the nation of Israel has 12 tribes. And that's why we always refer to it as the 12 tribes of Israel. That's just like the United States of America. Sometimes we just say America. But we mean the United States of 50 states of America. Well, we refer to it as the 12 tribes of Israel because they were made up of these multitude of ams, nations, tribes, people. Is that make, am, am I making sense here? Now, Jacob is reminding Joseph what God promised him in order to lay the groundwork for what he's about to do. He didn't just say, you know what my favorite memory in life was? Back in Bethel, God came to me and he brought... No, he's not telling one of his old stories. He's reminding Joseph of what God told him back at Bethel. But the reason he's doing that is because he's laying the groundwork for what he's about to do. Which is to adopt Joseph's two oldest sons as his own. Now, stick with me because chapter number 48 provides information that's vital to understanding the Old Testament. In fact, what you're about to learn this week, and especially next week, 99% of the pastors in America don't know. And that's why the majority of us as Christians get lost in the Old Testament and we don't like it. But the reason we don't like it is because we don't understand the foundation for the Old Testament. And chapter 48 provides the foundation for you to understand the prophets let me tell you, when you get into the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then you get to the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Seven, I, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. If you don't understand Genesis chapter 48, you're lost. You can teach Sunday school all your life. You can be a Christian for 45 years. You can even preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if you don't understand Genesis 48, you're lost. When you get to the prophets. So, stick with me as we go through chapter 48. Now let's look at verses 5 through 7. Now I am claiming as my own sons, these two boys of yours, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born here in the land of Egypt before I arrived. They will be my sons, just as Reuben and Simeon are. But any children born to you in the future will be your own. And they will inherit land within the territories of their brothers Ephraim and Manasseh. Long ago, as I was returning from Padam Aram, it's like he drifts off into this other story, but he's not drifting off. There's a reason for it. Rachel died in the land of Canaan. We were still on the way some distance from Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So with great sorrow, I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath. Now, did you catch that? Jacob is adopting Manasseh and Ephraim as his own sons. And they are going to receive an inheritance of land just like the other sons. And their descendants will become a tribe of their own within the nation of Israel. Now, people, this is a great honor for Joseph. As the recipient of the birthright, he was, he was supposed to receive a double portion of the inheritance. That always went to the person who had the birthright. Now, was it because he was special? Well, yes, but that's not the only reason. The reason he received a double portion is because whoever received the birthright, became the leader of the family, and he was responsible for all of the single women in the family. Therefore, he required more assets. But Jacob is now going to take it a step further. This is a great honor for Joseph because he's going to divide the two portions that Joseph was supposed to receive between Joseph's two sons. And he's going to treat Joseph's two sons as if they were his own sons. And so instead of there being one tribe known as the tribe of Joseph, think about it. Once we get out of here, do you ever hear of the tribe of Joseph? No. So instead of there being one tribe known as the tribe of Joseph, there's going to be two tribes that represent Joseph. Manasseh and Ephraim. Now people, I cannot stress how much of an honor this was to Joseph. And you don't understand that unless you're a parent. Because here Joseph is, and he's been chosen because he has the character he has 
every quality that's required to be the head of the family. And yet his, his dad says, okay, you're going to get two portions, but I'm not going to give you those two portions. I'm going to divide it between your sons. So instead of having one tribe that bears your name, you're going to have two tribes that represent you. They're going to be your two sons. And Joseph is beaming. Joseph's descendants are going to make up two of the 12 tribes. Now to help you to remember this and how it came to be, let me give you one verse. And if I were you, I would write this verse either in the back of your Bible or in the front of your Bible. I'm going to read it out of the NLT, but it says the same thing in any translation you might have. This is 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. This will help you when you want to remember Genesis chapter 48. It says, The oldest son of Israel was Reuben, but since he dishonored his father by sleeping with one of his father's concubines, his birthright was given to the sons of his brother Joseph. His birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. Now, we're going to clarify that in just a second. For this reason, Reuben is not listed in the genealogical records as the firstborn son. The descendants of Judah became the most powerful tribe and provided a ruler for the nation. Remember, because of Judah's character and because of his, his self-sacrificing act, he was going to give up his life for Benjamin, and he was a representation of what Christ would do for us. It was through his tribe, his descendants, that the Messiah would come. And next week, we're going to look that there's a break from tradition here. Because the person who receives the birthright, his descendants were supposed to be the one through which the line of Christ would come through. But we break with tradition here. The birthright is given to one. Another tribe is actually going to have the seed of the woman come through its descendants. But we're not there yet. The descendants of Judah became the most powerful tribe and provided a ruler for the nation. But the birthright belonged to who? Joseph. But the birthright belonged to who? So Joseph received the birthright, but the birthright was given to his sons. So Joseph's double portion was divided between his two oldest sons. And that's why you have the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. But you don't have a tribe of Joseph. You see, as a recipient of the birthright, Joseph received a double portion, but his two sons are the ones that's going to receive it, not Joseph. And this is something that you need to remember as you go through the Old Testament. Now, let's look at the adoption process a little bit more in depth, beginning with verse number five, and I'm going to pull out some details. Now, I am claiming as my own sons these two boys of yours, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born here in the land of Egypt before I arrived. They will be my sons just as Reuben and Simeon are. This is the official adoption process of Joseph's two sons by Jacob. And, and he's doing this in front of witnesses. In front of his witnesses, he's claiming Ephraim and Manasseh as his own. Now remember, someone told Joseph that his father, was, his health was rapidly failing. So immediately, Joseph comes with his two sons. But when he arrives, it says that Someone told, Joseph, or told Jacob, Joseph has arrived, and he helped him sit up in bed. And the same person, though he's not mentioned here, remained in the room when Joseph and his two sons came in, and he was the witness. And in all probability, that person would have been who? You know it on the tip of your tongue. Judah. Judah's the one that Jacob always sent before him. Judah had proved himself to be of good character. We do see that little slip in Genesis chapter 38. But at the same time, he's the one that would have been sent to Joseph. He comes back. He goes in to tell Jacob. He's the one taking care of him. Joseph has come to see you. He's there to help him set up. But he's also there as a witness. Now, to clarify his intentions so there's no misunderstanding, Jacob says this. They will be my sons just as Reuben and Simeon are. In other words, they will have the same rights and the same privileges as my legitimate sons, Simeon, or Reuben and Simeon. No distinctions will be made between them and my sons. Now, why did he say Reuben and Simeon? Why did he use them as examples? Because they were the, his two oldest sons. So he's saying, Joseph, your two oldest sons won't have anything less than what my two oldest sons do. They're going to have the same rights the same privileges. And then he goes further to clarify what he's doing. Look at verse number 6. But any children born to you in the future will be your own. And they will inherit land within the ter territories of their brothers, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ah, there it is. Do you see it? 
Ephraim and Manasseh will inherit a portion of the promised land just like Jacob's other sons, making each of them their own tribe within the nation of Israel. Now, Jacob is not taking anything away from his other sons. Remember, Joseph is receiving the birthright. Therefore, he gets a double portion. So when he gives a portion to his two sons, he's not giving anything away that would have gone to the other sons. So they don't have anything to complain about because Joseph is not receiving any land. Joseph is not receiving any of the assets. He has enough. But his sons are receiving it. Now, this privilege didn't extend to, Jacob, to Joseph's other sons. And Joseph had other sons. This privilege only extended to Ephraim and Manasseh. Joseph's other sons would inherit land within Ephraim and Manasseh's territory, just like the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren and so on of his other sons. Now, look at verse number 7. Long ago, as I was returning from Padan Aram, Rachel died in the land of Canaan. We were still on the way some distance from Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So with great sorrow, I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath. Now, this verse tells us that there was a little sentimental significance to Jacob adopting Joseph's two sons. If you remember, Rachel only had two children. And she died giving birth to the second child, Benjamin. So this was Jacob's way of attributing more children to Rachel and giving her more honor. Now, I'm going to stop here because what I'm going to be sharing from here on out, let me tell you, you really need to understand because as you're going through the Old Testament, sometimes you're just downright confused unless you understand what happens in this chapter. So I'm going to make sure that I have at least 40 minutes to go through it. But I want to pique your curiosity for next week. How many sons did Jacob have? Oh, come on. It's not a trick question. How many? He had 12 sons, right? Okay, how many sons of Joseph did he adopt? Two sons. How many sons does that equal? Fourteen sons. But Joseph doesn't get a portion because his double portion, one of each, goes to his sons. So we have to subtract from the fourteen sons. Let's subtract Joseph. How many tribes do you have? Thirteen. Well, it's the twelve tribes of Israel. Did one of the sons die before this happened? No. What's the deal? Next week, you're going to understand. And Genesis 48 lays the foundation for you to understand why there were 12 tribes of Israel. And you're also going to understand why when the kingdom split up, the southern kingdom was named what? Judah. The northern kingdom was referred to as one of two names. Israel or Ephraim. Why? You're going to find out next week.